you guys. Yeah, the uh, demand for rare earth metals continues to increase almost on a daily basis to a point where a lot of people don't really understand how many things we use on a day-to-day -day basis contain these rare earth metals. We're going to have a really interesting discussion today. Uh, Craig Taylor, CEO and Alex Knox, board advisor for Defense Metals, joining us. Gentlemen, good to have you on the show. Uh, Craig, I'll come to you first. Tell us a little bit about the, the company uh, and where we got to start and then how we kind of shifted as far as the focus for the company with this increased demand on a daily basis, as I mentioned, for these rare earth metals. Well, yeah, thanks very much. It's uh, good to be on. Yeah, it's a very exciting time to be in the, the rare earth space, as you mentioned. So defense metals, we've de-risked and advanced our deposit over the past two years to the point where we have one of the richest neodymium and praseodymium deposits in North America uh, in, time, in terms of size and grade. So neodymium and praseodymium, or NDPR for short, they're the key rare earth elements in producing very high strength, lightweight magnets. So these magnets can be found in many of our day-to-day -day products, such as computers, cell phones, refrigeration systems, medical equipment, and, and the list really goes on. Um, however, the big driver in the space right now is the electric vehicle and green energy explosion. So NDPR magnets are found in every single electric vehicle motor, every wind turbine, and maglev train produced. So they're found in countless military products as well, such as F-35 fighter jets, Trident submarines, guidance systems, um, and about our deposits. So we are we're located 70 kilometers from Prince George, BC, which is a mining hub in central British Columbia. Our deposit has road access, water, electricity on site. Um, there's a railway head 20 kilometers away. And our proximity to this infrastructure is very important as it brings our capex down considerably uh, compared to most rare earth deposits. And so we've taken a 30 ton bulk sample in early 2019 and shipped this ore to SGS labs for metallurgical testing, which is very important in the rare earth space. So SGS completed a flotation and hydromet testing and came back with, with really world-class results. So we then completed a 2000 meter drill program in the summer of 2019, and we hit on 13 of 13 holes drilled. And so this gave us enough data to, to essentially double the metal value of our overall resource and the confidence to build a flotation pilot plant then with SGS to prove that we can produce high grade concentrate on a commercial level. So that's sort of what we've done in the past. Uh, our future plans for 2021 include a PEA to be completed in the first half of the year. We'll do then a hydromet pilot plant that will be complete by June and a drill program scheduled by July followed up by another increased resource. So there's only a handful of viable rare earth deposits in North America as compared to say gold or silver or copper. And there's, there's hundreds of companies in those spaces. Um, so I believe we've been one of the most active of the, these rare earth companies over the past two years and will continue to advance and de-risk our deposit through 2021. It's an exciting time, as we mentioned, and I want to talk a little bit about uh, the actual metal itself, and maybe we can bring in uh, Alex here and, and discuss a little bit about the difference specifically when it comes to some of these rare earth metals. For those who are unaware, you know, it maybe compare them to something more commonly found in mine, like a copper or any of the uh, more commonly found metals, and it's the processing, and correct me if I'm wrong, that does differentiate this. Yes, exactly. There are 14 different rare earth metals, and they all occur together in any rare earth deposit. Any rare earth deposit on earth contains all 14. So the ratios between these rare earths may differ um, based from deposit to deposit. So if you're if you're mining a copper deposit, how it's typically done is that you you uh, crush the ore, extract the copper bearing mineral, and then smelt it to, re to release the copper and sell it. In a rare earth deposit, because all 14 rare earths occur in the same deposit, there's one extra step. So you start off by mining the ore, um, extracting the minerals that contain the rare earths, 
but then you have, and then sm smelt them to produce a rare earth oxide, mixed rare earth oxide. But then there's another step where you must take that mixed rare earth oxide and send it to a separation plant where the individual rare earths are separated from one another and those that are economically viable can then, can then be sold as a, as a pure rare earth oxide. The process of this purification is it's well known. It's been done since the 1970s, but it's rather capital intensive. And now governments, both in Canada and the United States, are have decided that they want to get into the rare earth uh, separation business so that they can provide a domestic source of rare earths for all these uh, applications that Craig had mentioned. So that one extra step is, is rather capital intensive, and now it looks like the governments, both in Canada and the United States, are going to endeavor to make these rare earth separation plants available, and that makes the economics of mining rare earths profitably uh, so much greater. Craig Taylor and Alex Knox uh, joining us from Defense Mendels. Uh, gentlemen, when we talk a little bit about the quality of both the product coming out of the ground and the mine itself, from a market perspective, how is the actual quality of both the mine and the metals determined? Yeah, so we've, we've achieved a very high grade deposit. Uh, it's 3% LREO, and we've got 17 million tons of ore uh, to draw from during, in this current resource. We're expecting to expand on that, but that, those are world-class numbers, and, and they compare to really the only uh, mine that's producing in North America. It has over a billion dollar market cap, and that's MP Materials or Mountain Pass. And coincidentally, uh, Alex has done a lot of work with that company in the past before it was Mountain Pass, and, and maybe he can talk to the, the differences in the deposits or the similarities. Yes. Yeah. So both, both deposits, uh, Mountain Pass and Rashida, um, Defense Metals, um, they both occur in the same kind of rock, a dolomite carbonatite. Uh, both uh, deposits contain the mineral bastocyte, which is a rare earth fluorocarbonate. Um, uh, the Washita deposit also contains monazite. Both all of these um, rare earth minerals have been, have been the cracking of these minerals to produce the rare earth oxides has been done for many years in the past. So we're not inventing an, a new, a new um, technology. The, the remaining resource at Mountain Pass is about the same size as the Washita deposits, so they're about the same size. Um, one of the differences is that that Mountain Pass has been mined since 1952 and extensively since the 1970s. And since it dips gently into the ground, the stripping ratio at Mountain Pass, according to uh, a recent uh, MP um, prospectus, is about five to one. So they have to remove about five tons of ore to to five tons or five tons of waste to recover one ton of ore. The the stripping ratio at the Rashida deposit, since it occurs on a small hill and outcrops under very shallow uh, layer of, of soil, should be much much better. And that, and therefore the economics of extracting and the cost of extracting a ton of rare earth ore from Rashida should be much more favorable than presently exists at Mountain Pass due to the fact that Mountain Pass has been in production for over 40 years. We mentioned recently uh, there was an investment made by the Department of Defense in the U.S. into this space and into this sector. You spoke briefly earlier uh, in regards to the rarity of these metals uh, in North America specifically. What does the, the investment from the U.S. government into this space mean for a company like Defense Metals? Well, this is going to be critical for us and the whole space going forward. You know, right now, 80% of rare earth production is done in China, and that's really problematic for the West, seeing as China can now absorb all of their production internally, and they're threatening to cut off supplies to the West or weaponize rare earths, as they say. So the Department of Defense and the Department of Energy have been working with three processors in uh, the U.S., one being Mountain Pass, one being... Um, energy fuels and the other Linus uh, to fund processing plants in the U.S. so that we're not reliant on China. There's another one in Canada, um, SRC, who's been funded by the Canadian government in hopes of doing the same. 
So we would be a natural feed for all three of the, all four of those scenarios, and and that gives us a customer locally, and we would be a potential mine locally to feed those processing plants. So when it comes to the space itself, you just mentioned uh, a few of the participants in the rare earth metal space. What sets defense metals apart here? Why defense metals in you know regards to uh, better quality, better you know proximity to a mine? Why defense metals when we talk about this space? Well, one thing about defense metals, and it's very important in in the rare earth space, is that the minerals which contain the rare earths are rather coarse grained in this deposit, and certainly coarser grained than the average you would find in the rare earth space. This coarse grain uh, mineralization uh, combined with the high grade makes, makes the processing very efficient. The recoveries are much better when, when a mineral is coarse in a rock than when it's fine. So this coarse grain, the simple mineralogy and the, and the relatively high grade are both going to make the capital costs and the, and the processing costs for, for the Washita deposit much lower than you'll see for some deposits that are finer grained. And Mountain Pass is certainly a finer grain deposit uh, the, in terms of the rare earth minerals than uh, Washita. So it, it's a natural advantage that Washita uniquely possesses, uniquely possesses in especially the Canadian space and, and North American space for to allow the, the cheap and easy processing at high recoveries so, so the, that the uh, rare earth concentrate uh, can be made uh, effectively and with, with significant recovery. So that's a real advantage of this deposit. Listed on the TSX guys here in Toronto, DEFN is the ticker, OTC markets. You can check them out, DFMTF as well. Uh, Craig Taylor and Alex Knox from Defense Metals. Appreciate your time today. Best of luck. Thank, well, you. thank you very much. There we go, guys, a little bit of a look at uh, the rare earth metal space, something that is going to become more and more popular as we continue along the road that we're currently on, uh, using all of these devices that have these things in them uh, on a daily basis.